Hey gang, what is happening? I hope your world is good. I just recently finished this blade storage cabinet. It was well needed in my shop. It'll hold 20 blades, or you can double that, stack the blades on top of each other with a piece of cardboard in between. Anyway, thanks for joining me. Let me show you how I did this. So to start this cabinet, I cut two sides, a back, a bottom, and a top, and added some edging. Just using the proverbial blue tape to apply this. If I had a bunch to do, I would take this to my brother's shop and have it ran through his edge bander. But for something that's this small, this works well. So I'm getting ready to cut some rebates or rabbits. But first I wanted to show you this. And this won't work for all routers. This is actually the Porter Cable 7518 router. And I just took an extra wrench, welded on that extra end. And so I can just drop it in place. It sits flat on the table and it can rest against the plunge depth rod, and then I can easily loosen or tighten the collet. This makes it easy because one wrench is always securely stopped against the plunge rod. This is a time-tested method that I like to employ for attaching a top or bottom to a side panel. The sides get that stopped rebate, and that other cut is known as a relish, and I'll show more on that here in a bit. So here I'm doing a test cut for that relish cut, and I like using the top portion of this flush cut bit because I know that area is going to be sharp. So you kind of get double duty out of your router bits that way. I've got a dado stack in my saw and this will create about a quarter inch wide cut. And I can make all these dados in both of the side panels. And I thought I would come up with an easy way to create the spacing that would work for both sides. I have the fence set to start with either the top or bottom dado. I make a cut in one side, then the other, and then I can use a spacer between this magnetic block and the fence to create all the subsequent cuts. And so even if one is off in relation to the other, they'll match from side to side. I love this shop made magnetic block. I use it all the time for different tasks. It's kind of like a mag switch, but on steroids. On this first side panel, you'll notice that I'm cutting into the edging rather than the blade exiting, which would cause it to chip out. But wait, what about the other panel, right? Well, I just glued a sacrificial board to it. I can make all those dado cuts and then we can remove that later. So I continue dado after dado, making a cut on each panel, adding the magnetic block against the fence, moving the fence over with a spacer and continue. Notice how I made a couple of black magic marker lines in line with the blade just for added safety. And now with all the dados cut on both panels, I can slice that sacrificial piece off the front edge. I should have a beautiful clean cuts with no splintering. Pocket screws and glue will work well for holding the components together. So I just use this Craig Foreman to make that action quick and easy. I don't employ this thing often, but it's much faster than the clamp and jig method. Since the top of this cabinet will be visible, I wanted to use biscuits instead of pocket screws because adding pocket screws from underneath would push this component out of that dado. You can see here, I just like anchoring my biscuit machine down. I find that the cuts are more consistent and accurate. All right, so I kind of thought this might happen. So anytime you have a panel, you cut a bunch of grooves in it. Uh, each one of those grooves is releasing a minuscule amount of tension and it opens up and you can see these panels have bowed. So each panel is bowed in. So to remedy that, I'm going to put some pieces in here. This would designate the, uh, the bottom for the saw blade. And so this would just be right up above it. It still gives me about 3 8 5 16 nine millimeters or so clearance and the blades are only eight inch thick so should be should be fine and with that i can you know straighten out these panels by putting these uh pieces i'm going to put about six i'm going to put about six of them in here something like that no big shake it's a bit Unfortunate that I had to add those because it could cause a problem later, but I'm going to continue. Obviously, I have the carcass glued up at this stage and I'm using two separate pieces where I can get a good size of all these sliding shelves. 
drawers. All right, remember that backer I put, uh, cutting these dados? So this is the side, let's see. Yeah, that went forward. So this side didn't need a backup. That went into the blade, but this side was exiting the blade and you can see how really nice and clean. Totally worth it. It's probably no secret that I love this type of handle. I developed this when I first made my main workbench and they're super easy to make very ergonomic you can reach down anywhere and grab the drawer and open it i start out by making these three eighths of an inch or yeah 0.375 this will be enough material to make all of the drawer fronts they're quite small in height and here just a quick reminder i like to clean that collet each and every time i use a different router bit Speaking of router bits, this is what I use. I believe it's called a beading bit, and this one is a 3 8 diameter, which will match the exact thickness of the handles that we ran through the planer. A sample cut or two will ensure that the router bit is cutting dead center on the stock, right? So once I have that established, I start with the pieces upright, and using a feather board just makes sense. Then I lay them down to finish the cut. I have an in-depth video on this and I'll leave a link in the description. A fantastic way to make a quick and easy handle. Now, don't be banging your brand new blade as you enter the cavity to install it, right? Those teeth are super fragile. That carbide is hard and very brittle. So take your time getting it in there. It's a pet peeve of mine. I see it way too often. You might not see the small chips that you could make, but if you bang it even once, you could chip a tooth. So for this particular sized handle, I'll use a 3 16th spacer to set the distance between the blade and the fence. Once that looks good, oops, I forgot to set the height. Here's what I love about this type of fence. I can just move it back without changing my fence setting. For that and other reasons, I love this type of a fence. Hedgehog featherboard to keep everything nice and tight, and these are the results. Small as they may be, I can quickly run all the drawer fronts through the drum sander. Some marks on the bottoms of the handles can easily be removed with a shoulder plane. So these have been ran, so these were ripped off a wider board, right? So this was the top and the bottom. So this was ran through the joiner planer. So these edges are good. And then this was a cut. So this is just a saw blade cut and I marked that with pencil marks so I would know that. This front side was ran through my drum sander, but it still had some scratches from that. So I'm cleaning it up with a belt sander with 180 grit. So this will be nice and clean. Then this handle will go on just about flush with the back. You know, there's no, there's no need working on this yet because we want to get this piece, the handle, flush with the back of this drawer front. We'll do that at a later time. So everything in proper order. So this is the front. I'm going to put a bead of glue close to the front, but I don't want it to um, migrate past the front, right? It'll just be glue we have to clean out. One down the middle. The majority of the glue I want here in the back. So I want that part to squeeze out. I'll show you what I mean. Now, and this will apply to a lot of situations where you're applying glue or a piece of wood to another piece of wood. I could just plop that straight down, right? But that would allow the glue to migrate toward the front. And this would probably be kind of hard to clean underneath here after the glue dries. I mean, yeah, you could get glue after it's softened a bit but why do that if you don't have to so what we're going to do is we're going to put this piece of wood on like this and squeegee that glue toward the back that makes more sense right and yeah i'm doing two at a time here i'll just bring my pin in a little ways these will be getting cut to length at some point but 
Get that glue off my fingers. Plenty of glue squeeze in the back and this handle, I want just about flush, maybe sticking out um, just a tad in the back. This is a 23 gauge pins or brads, whatever you want to call them, and they're a half inch length. 3 16 material, they don't need to be too long. Now, if this was a high-end piece, I would go one step further and put that pin in the dark grain. Boom, boom, boom. That way, later, when I'm using color put putty to hide those pinholes, it's it just makes things easier. All those details, yeah, it adds up. See? No glue. That's awesome, right? All that glue squeezes in the back. Because this is going to be a joint, and... Yeah, it's just a shop cabinet, not going to be seen, but you practice these types of techniques and later when it counts, you're, you're used to it, you have a plan down. So I'm the kind of guy that wears a belt and suspenders, so I'm going to go ahead and add some clamps. The pins hold it in place, the clamps will make the joint tight. And probably what I'll do is I'll get two of these done and then put them face to face so each one acts as its own cowl and you get a better consistent um, clamping pressure. But yeah, that looks good underneath there. And of course in the back is awesome. That's good. Well, I couldn't clamp two at a time. The clamps wouldn't open up enough, but this works just as well. I thought I'd make quick work of cleaning up the glue and flushing up the back of the handles with the back of the drawer front here at the table saw. And I love these feather boards by Hedgehog, and sometimes I'll use this magnetic block just to lock them in place. Being aware of where the tipping point front and back on this belt sander will give me consistent results. And I note that by clamping it in place where I can designate one of the bench dogs to clarify that. Here I'm removing the melamine to create a raw surface, right? Typically I would use melamine glue, but it doesn't have a very long shelf life and mine had gone bad, so always solutions, right? This will make more sense in a bit, but essentially what I'm doing here is I'm routing the two front corners of these drawer bottoms with a quarter inch radius router bit. I'll be using a half inch diameter router bit to create the matching profile in the drawer fronts. So an easy way to do this is to stack them all up and route them at once. And you'll notice that I'm going into the cut so I don't have any blowout. All right, so here at the router table, this is working well to create this rabbit. I was having a little bit of a problem with this blowing out on this tailing end. And so I added a little bit of glue there. I uh, went and did something else, came back, and it's helping, but it's still it's still blowing out a little bit. So a better solution is to take a marking gauge and sever those fibers for, you know, that thickness of that melamine, that quarter inch bottom. And that does the trick. Let's see, here's one that I just did super clean. So yeah, that's a better, better solution. Always solutions, right? So you may notice a couple of things. First, I've got stops, and then to fine tune those stops, I just added some blue tape. And there you go, that's exactly what we were after, right? Excellent, excellent. <laughs> I'm a dork. Air compressor kicked on there, but yeah, belt sander, Quick, easy, effective. At my old work, we used to build literally thousands upon thousands of box construction cabinets for schools, banks, and we would chamfer the bottoms. That way, if they're scooted across the floor before they got set up on toe kicks, you wouldn't have any chipping. And a belt sander is an effective way to do that, much faster than a router. Nothing too tricky here, just drilling some access holes to push the blades out. I love this little remote. It's basically just a switched outlet with a remote <laughs> that I use for my shop vac. And here I'm just drilling a small hole 
I'll add a dowel and this is what will keep the blades in place. Usually I prefer sanding before I route, that way you don't transfer any bumps to your routed edge. Makes sense, right? So I'm working on this blade box and I've got a few saw marks on some of this edging. It's uh, very slight, but you know, and there's some areas that are, aren't quite flush, a little bit of glue. Uh, a lot of ways to clean that up. I'm going to use a belt sander. So to start, I just put the sander in place, pull the trigger. By starting in the corner and with a light touch, this establishes flat. Unless there's a big chunk of glue, you'd have to be aware of that. Then I sand a little over half the length of the component. I'll do that all the way around and then I can hit it with something like this. Again, I start in the corner, establish flat, and I'll go a little over half the length of a side or a bottom and repeat that process all the way around. All right, progress thus far. Now, initially, let me put one of these guys on here. Initially, when I designed this, I planned on putting a cleat here and here, this guy. Something like this is gonna be about 5 eighths wide, 15, 16 millimeters wide. It was gonna go on here. It would be about the height of this. I would use melamine glue and use countersunk screws um, from underneath to secure that. And that would have tr helped tremendously to stiffen this quarter inch panel, right? Well, then I ran into the situation with the sides of this bowing in. So if you make one of these, it might be a better idea to take a uh, board and groove it, attach that and your pieces would go in that. Or you could put individual cleats, one on each side of the quarter inch to, to house the quarter inch uh, panel. Lots of ways to do this. I ended up grooving this or you know cutting dados and then the sides bowed in. So to counter that, I added these dudes, which helped. Those are straight, but now I don't have the room really for anything like this. I mean, I could put one laying flat like that. It'd help a little bit, I guess. But as I'm starting to think about this, I don't know if I even need it. So let's say we have a blade. Let me grab a blade here. 10 inch blade to go on here. And yeah, when it comes out, it, it bows down, but it's not gonna stay open. So I don't know if I'll do anything about about that. I didn't. That's why this is wider than it normally would be because I had allowed for a cleat here and here for a 12 inch blade. Let me grab that 12 inch blade. See, I'd have plenty of room on each side of that for the for that cleat, but don't know if I'm gonna do that. This might just work fine just like this. And the way I was thinking about it later, I could always add that. So I'm probably gonna skip that. So I'm about ready to lacquer everything and then I can start attaching these handles. My buddy David Bedrosian made a cabinet like this recently and he used two layers of quarter inch. The top layer had a hole for the saw blades and then the bottom one went in the slots. And that seemed to work really well. So yeah, lots of ways to do things. All right, I want to show you this before I put the back in. This is the back side. And this type of construction is what we used at the old shop I worked at. We did thousands and thousands of drawer boxes or uh, box construction, I should say, for you know schools, banks, reception counters, tons of uh, carcass type cabinets. We call it Euro style, no face frame. And back then we used primarily um, a lot of melamine. So a lot of melamine interiors, and then they were Formica um, clad, you know, on the outside finished ends. This is the construction we would, we would use for an upper cabinet. This would actually be the top. This would be the bottom of the upper cabinet. The backs, we used a 5 8 thick uh, melamine, and all the, the sides, tops and bottoms were 3 quarter. Shelves were 3 quarter, 5 8 back, so it was a very strong cabinet. I've seen these fall out of the back of a truck 
and uh, get pretty beat up, you know, rolling down the highway, but they wouldn't fall apart. We would use a dado, like I'm, like shown here on the sides. The, the, uh, the top on the upper was uh, deeper by five eighths thick, you know, to account for the back. And then of course the bottom ones is, is uh, five eighths shallow and lines up with this dado. Very strong method of doing this. The reason we did it like this is so you didn't have four sides that were, you know, enclosed. This gives you a little bit of slack on the height because sometimes the melamine's not exactly 5.8. I mean, it's metric, but 19.4. Sometimes it would be slightly thicker or, um, you know. So this way we could put the, the back on and we would let it hang down just slightly. That would get flushed up and then that would get covered with Formica for for an upper cabinet, this would be the bottom of the upper and that would get covered with Formica. Um, on a base cabinet like this, you could actually leave this up slightly and you'd never have to mess with it, right? So, yeah, very, very strong cabinet. And we used to use, uh, you're gonna laugh, but let me grab the gun that we used to assemble these with. Well, I just remember I let my brother uh, borrow it, but it's a two inch staple a half inch crown, boom, boom, boom. So we're getting parts coming off the saw, off the edge bander. They go through the routing sequence to create the dados. And then the guys are banging those together, nailing them really quick. There's no clamps, no dry time. You assemble them. With glue, of course. Sand them slightly to scuff up the melamine, cover them with Formica, and boom. Add the doors and they are out the door. Very fast, very effective. So obviously, since I have finished ends in wood, not for mica, I use pocket screws to attach the back. Now, another advantage of using the 5 8 material for a back is that you, we could put screws anywhere. We didn't have to, you know, we weren't tied to only putting vertical screws in studs. A lot of times on commercial jobs, they're metal studs. They don't have a lot of biting power for screws. So the general contractor would put horizontal strips of blocking or backing and we could put screws wherever we wanted in that 5 8 back. The 5 8 back also squares up the carcass automatically, so once you put the back in, you're done. And then, since back sizes were kind of random as far as widths and heights, we could only get so many out of a sheet, but we would always have fall off. So the long lengths, eight foot lengths of fall off of 5 8 material, we would run through the edge bander, and this was what we would use for our drawer stock. So proportionally, it was a good size, 5 eighths thick for drawer boxes and pretty clean. And then we used the quarter inch. Now, this is actually not melamine. This is called a cold roll. It's slightly different than melamine. It's one-sided. Uh, we used melamine glue to adhere this to the drawer sides, but a uh, very strong drawer box and a pretty good match in the color. So anyway, I thought I would share that little bit of commercial casework construction. All right, there's all the numbers cut. One through 20, created with a shaper origin. You can see that profile of the handle slash drawer front. Super quick, easy, always very fun. So at this point, I'm super happy with the fit. These are just dry fit, no glue, but it looks like everything's gonna work out just right. Making the stopped rebates this way means I stay precise and all the ends of the drawer fronts will line up automatically. I suppose for this application, I could have used four directional wheels, but once I move it out, I thought it'd be easier to maneuver. So swivel casters in the front. The other advantage of having a rabbit here on the bottom, uh, well, anywhere you have a rabbit, you're gonna have the advantage, but here on the bottom, since you're gonna have a lot of weight on this, even though this cabinet's small, I mean, there's a sheet and a half of quarter inch alone, plus the sides, plus all the blades, it's gonna get pretty heavy. But since there's a rabbit here, 
It looks like a blind rabbit because you don't see the rabbit here on the end because of this relish. But since there's a rabbit here, all that weight is being applied to that uh, rebate or rabbit. And so it carries the weight and it's not just relying on a butt joint. So big difference. Doing a few at a time, I clamped and glued the drawer fronts to the saw blade pullouts. So I had a few that needed a bit of persuasion, but nothing that a couple of pins and clamps can't fix. So does this count as office work if I'm using this old office chair? Sometimes I need a comfortable place to sit if I'm sanding or doing something like that. So yeah, good way to upcycle, right? So I've been using this thing for a while and I absolutely love it. It works perfectly. And remember, if you make one, Remember the sides could bow in if you cut all those grooves. So you can make one like this, but make it better than mine and address that potential problem. All right, there it is. Blade storage box, right? 20, uh, 20, 20 drawers, 20 blades, 12 inch. And I didn't label each one for each particular blade. I just numbered them, number, you know, one through, one through 20. And I know my needs or blades will change over the years. So I just made a reference sheet made sense to me. Well, I just got a few blades back from the sharpener and I'm eager to put those back in the missing spots. Thank you for watching. Remember to click, like, subscribe, learn.